Good morning. How are you? Thank you for being here. I know we'd all love to uh, chat for hours and hours and hours. So find a place to sit. We'll begin our program here shortly after our initial announcements. So glad to see so many of you here today. My name is Sam Vigil, Jr. I am the president of AFP Oregon and Southwest Washington. And we are excited about the programs that we have lined up for the rest of this year. Um, just a uh, really a quick heads up for our April meeting. And you'll see more about that coming up, of course. Uh, the three Ds of diversity. And I pulled out the wrong sheet of paper, so I don't have that piece of paper in front of me at the very moment, because I could give you all the details. Ah, found it. Three Ds of diversity. Our community in 3D, excuse me. Diversity, demographics, and demand. Uh, next month we'll be, we'll be at the University Club uh, because the space here was not available. Uh, so please be aware for that. Um, one of my favorite questions at our meetings is here is, how many CFREs do we have in the audience? Terrific. We're always glad to see CFREs. How many of you are, how many aspiring CFREs? Is that the rest of you? <laughs> we would like that to be, of course. Um, one of the things that we do here for AFP is every summer we hold a series of um, courses for the, uh, for the CFRE. And before I continue with that, I just rem remember that, uh, just wanted to remind you that we see, um, you see the cameras here today. We are live streaming and we re are re recording. So we are pleased to have people in remote regions of the state joining us today. And they will have the ability to email in their comments and questions to join in dis discussion as we go. Okay, back to CFRE. Uh, every summer we have a, a, a hold a CFRE study session, and to tell us more about that is one of our chairpersons of our CFRE study committee, uh, Megan Jolly. So we have our CFRE class orientation it will be coming up on May 28th. We'll be holding it at Mercy Corps this year, which is right down on uh, NATO Parkway and First or. Ankeny, I'm sorry. And that will be from 5.30 to 7, to 7 p.m. We are requesting RSVPs. On each of your tables is a form about the class. Um, the actual classes, there will be five sessions, and they will go from July 30th through August 27th, every Wednesday. Um, the class is incredibly informative. It is a great class, whether you're prepping to take the CFRE exam or if you are um, new to the development field, it's a fantastic overview, overview of best practices in the field of development. So I'd really recommend any of you um, that are interested, come to the orientation and check it out. If uh, Jess, can you stand up a sec? If you have any questions, uh, get in touch with Sam, Jess, Jessica, or I, and we're more than happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Megan, and thank you, Jessica, for chairing that committee. Um, last year, we had a really dynamic group. It was a lot of fun um, and a lot of good, intense review and study. Um, is Diane Dickey in the room today? Diane Dickey is a chair of our AFP Philanthropy Awards, uh, which uh, takes place um, in November. The deadline for nominating honorees is April 12. So, you know, got a few days. We're open for nominations for honorees for the 2014 Annual Philanthropy Day Awards. And so we would like to encourage you to go to our website and uh, click the link there, and you can find information about, um, about uh, nominating folks. Uh, the Philanthropy Awards, November 17, Portland Hilton Grand Ballroom. And um, that's the latest information we have. So. We're a little bit ahead of schedule, but that's okay. So because now um, it's time to begin our program here in just a moment. And I'd like to thank Betsy Fryer, VP of Professional Development, for the work that she has done to um, create our programs this year, to fill out the calendar. And uh, we have some great things coming up. But to introduce today's program, here's Betsy. Thanks, Kevin. Welcome, everyone. And it's so great. Sorry, Sam. It's so great that you're here since we don't have a snowstorm today. So we're really glad that you were able to make it um, this month instead. 
This is a really busy topic for all of us. There's a lot of conversation going on. Um, there was a session a couple of weeks ago, Portland Business Alliance had Dr. Drucker speaking about the Phil Knight Challenge. So we really believe we're gonna have a great afternoon, uh, great input from speakers, but this is a very interactive program. So this is not an opportunity for you just to sit and eat lunch. There are cards on your table. There will be several times where we break into discussions at the group. So please participate and please make this a very involved luncheon. So Kevin Johnson and I together have been talking about this for some time. Um, we have, as I said, a wonderful panel. I'm going to have him as the moderator introduce our panel. And Kevin um, has done an amazing job taking some of the research from the philanthropy survey that he completed and presented last month. So there's some information that is at your tables that it was withheld um, specifically for this program because it's really relevant to the conversation we're having today. So Kevin, are you ready? Should be live, right? Now I am? Okay, great, thanks. Good afternoon. <laughs> we have a number of people who, uh, in the audience today who could also be panel members. This, this crowd, when I looked at the list, was an amazing representation of the nonprofit sector in Oregon. You represent groups large and small of all types and sizes. So I'm, we're going to have some homework. So I want you to start thinking about your responsibility. Because when we think about philanthropy, as you all know, philanthropy is not a spectator sport. So I'd like to thank, first thank our panel members. And on your tables should be a bio of each of them so that you got some background about them, as well as some information uh, about how to contact them if you'd like to do that as well. We have a wide range of folks here. So today we're going to talk about the upside and downside of this gift. And one of the reasons we wanted to have this session today is that there's a lot, there was a lot of conversation going on about this. How does it affect the philanthropic world? How does it affect nonprofits? Does it affect my group? Will it affect the groups I care about? And there, was a, there wasn't really any data. So we've had a chance to do, complete the philanthropy survey. And many of you uh, participated, and many of you have likely seen some of the results. At your table is an excerpt from that survey in regards to the questions regarding, and I'm going to say this very precisely, the Phil Knight challenge and, separate, the OHSU campaign to meet the challenge. So I think it's important as we think about the today and philanthropy is to begin to distinguish that they're really two very different things. And when we think about philanthropy trends and what it might mean for our community, there are different topics. We're going to try and pull some of those apart a little bit today so that all of us can have a more informed conversation with our supporters, with our executives, with our teams, and with the people who make through their contributions of time and money who make it possible to do much of the good work that we do. So we're going to launch right into this question. So upside or downside? Now, why this exercise? Many years ago, I managed a company of psychologists, and we worked with uh, large organizations and uh, government agencies. And we very quickly discovered that unless you get the issues on the table, they fester within an organization or within a community. So this first exercise, and you've got some cards, this first exercise is for you to write down all of the upside things that you can think about. Now, don't put your name on this, because what are we going to do? We're going to actually shuffle, collect them and shuffle the cards and redistribute them. So you've got either a green or blue card, that's upside, and a downside, pink or yellow. So this is just a chance for you to say, what do you think? What do you worry about? Or what are you glad about? So I'm going to, now, don't, you don't share this with people at your table. And in le, if you're used to putting your name on everything, don't do that this time. <laughs> We're going to take a couple minutes and give everybody a chance to write down those things. Now, of course, there's going to be some table conversation. but. Write it down. I mean, this is, the, this is like, in a sense, the best possible outcome and the worst possible outcome. 
And here's why. If we don't begin to think about it, we may not be able to move beyond that. Because if we don't recognize what we're thinking or what we fear or we have been unable to name it, we can't choose anything different. So you're on. A couple minutes. This is going to go fast. You're on. You might be writing down something that's personal in regards to your own giving. You might be writing down something in regard to the community. You might be writing down something in regard to your nonprofit. Lots of different perspectives that you might be thinking about. And you can combine them. There are lots of different ways to look at this. Now, here's one more caveat in this. If, you, if there's an upside or downside that you have not written down, well, let's say it this way. Um, are you a stubborn person? And Because I want make, to want to make sure that we get this out on the table so that we can choose to <laughs> choose that it's the right perspective or move on. So we're going to start collecting the cards. If, if one person at each table would collect them, different colors, so, so they have two sets per table, then we'll come around and we'll grab them, and then we're going to start shuffling them. All right. So I'm going to arbitrarily just hand some out at each table so you can get a sense of what people are saying. Now, what I'm handing out now are upside. There you are. And your assignment at the table is to, for someone to read them out loud and take a couple of minutes to, to talk about them. What do you hear? What do you see? So you're on. This table's got some cards? Okay. There. There are a few. So read them out loud to your table mates and take a minute to say, what do you see? What do you hear? So let's hear from a couple of the panel members as they reflect on this. And I'm going to call Lisa first, and then Bob Speltz, and then Peter Korn. So, Lisa, you're done chewing? OK, good. <laughs> so where is the microphone? Oh, it needs to be there. Oh, there, perfect. I probably don't need one, but <laughs> hi, Kev. So you, do, you actually do need one because otherwise they can't hear you on camera. OK. So just any reflections on the conversation at your table? You don't have to read any of them. In fact, maybe it might be better to not read any of them, but just reflections. Could be, could be a lot, it could be a little, and if any of the other panel members want to say something now, get your hand up, otherwise we'll keep, keep moving along. Uh, we started with the positive comments, and so I think we were all feeling really good about it, about how it's going to raise the visibility of philanthropy, how it raises the bar, that um, large gifts do create a psyche in a, in a region of what is appropriate to invest in nonprofits, and um, and then we started reading the negative ones, so then the tone kind of felt a little different. And that, you know, was uh, representative of other health care organizations feeling that this is really going to impact them and that funds will be diverted, that um, smaller campaigns might suffer. And so uh, I think, you know, there really is two sides to that coin. Thank you. Bob. Our table um, touched on the positives and the I think the first thing that was mentioned really was something easily overlooked that that this challenge could could lead to breakthrough discoveries in cancer prevention or uh, treatment uh, protocols and things like that. So the ability to cure cancer or at least detect it jumped right out at, at everybody. Um, also, uh, the benefits that would uh, come to Oregon and specifically the Portland metro region, how 
how this uh, challenge, is, challenge, if successful in OHSU, if it becomes a top 10 uh, cancer research center in the country or in the world, how that can elevate, elevate the regional economy and the regional brand. Um, and then the third piece was the other medical possibilities that come, the other um, science discovery um, innovation that comes from having an influx of the best and brightest in the region. So it might be something related to cancer, but not cancer directly. Thanks. Peter. So our group, uh, our table here, <clears throat> uh, never got past one phrase. <laughs> a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, I keep hearing that over and over, so I asked the table, can we unpack that? What does it really mean? Because it's a cliche. If there's substance behind it, we explored that. Um, a rising tide doesn't necessarily mean that more donors are going to be uncovered that will give to other organizations. It sounds like there was some sense of that. Um, but there was also the sense that, yes, uh, the idea of philanthropic giving might become more present in people's minds. That might be the rising tide. Uh, what else, what else do I mean? did we talk about here on that? Um, well, the other side is that, the other side is that uh, maybe the tide doesn't rise for anyone other than the organization who is uh, benefiting from the challenge. Right. But, and I think that we could have gone on and on because I think that's a really important one to explore in detail and not just to accept in its cliched version. Thank you. Dick. Yes. Uh, I'm Dick Withnell, and I, our comments uh, were very similar to the other, other uh, tables. But just Dick, can you hold it a little closer? Were very, similar to the, uh, very similar to the other tables, but we in Salem, I'm from Salem, I'm a business person in Salem, so I'm on the other side of the fence, so to speak. I'm not the professionals like you are, and I guess maybe I would have a different, maybe a different take a little bit if, if I was from your position. But we had a croc center come dump in the center of us, $43 million, and we had to raise $8 million, and there was two or three campaigns that were going on right at that time, but we had a very narrow window to be able to finish the agreement for the croc to get that $43 million. The business people, or the leaders of the community, went to these other 501c3s and said, here's an opportunity, and uh, we really need to have everyone come behind this, and they did. But what I'm, the point I want to try to really make is, is that after we did, we were successful doing the Croc Center, and it's a beautiful facility down there, we actually raised $13 million in a very short period of time. Of course, having Jerry Frank behind it helped a little bit. But then the, the other 501c3 now have that chit to the leadership of the community, and we re-engaged their campaigns and made it successful. And what we found into the giving of the community in the mid Willamette Valley, that because of that, it, ra it did raise high tide in the mm -hmm. awareness of the other givers. Thank you. Let's take a little bit of time to look at the current gift marketplace. And this is, is from data from the re recent, re recently conducted survey. Now, this is, this is the report of fundraising last year. A lot of groups raised more money here in Oregon. So that's a good thing. Now, at the same time, uh, the goals for a lot of organizations are also up. For some groups, they're up a lot. So when we think about what made a real difference, uh, major giving played a part in all of this conversation. In other words, regardless of size of organization, larger gifts made a difference. And the way I, might, I described it recently to someone is like having a car and you're planning a road trip. You know, regardless of how nice your car is, if you start out with an eighth tank of gas, you're not going to get very far on the road trip. Philanthropy is how you get to fill that, that tank of gas for many organizations. It is the money that makes possible a lot of the innovative things. Uh, it makes possible... Uh, doing a lot more, it makes possible leveraging public funds and other kinds of fees. So it is critical, but the key is, is larger gifts of all, and larger gifts is a relative thing, but they're all very important. So even for small groups, a $500 or a thousand or a $5,000 gift, very important. Um, for larger organizations with bigger budgets, again, add a zero or maybe a comma. Nevertheless, major gifts are important. A small number of people so to speak, make those kind of gifts. So let's look at where the big gifts come from. Now, this is the first time I've actually seen any data about where some of the larger gifts come from for Oregon nonprofits. 
it's, and this is focused on the larger, the, a, a subset of the top 25 fundraising organizations. And you can see at the, at the far right, the million dollar gifts, most of them are from right here, right here. Now there's some, uh, and the uh, 100,000 to 499, the, the two, kind of the center right, those are, those are skewed a bit by higher education. Actually, do you have any comments? I'm, I might call you, if you do, I can call on you in a minute. Okay, so uh, in a minute I'm gonna, microphone, where are they? Great, could you get that to Amanda? So one of the things that we looked at in terms of where does the money come from, it, because we wanted a sense of, you know, is it real? Is the money coming for big projects coming from outside of state? And is there a multiplier effect? Amanda, if you could stand. Yeah, I would say that, that that's skewed entirely by higher education. So when we looked at those top fundraising groups in our state um, and some from Southwest Washington as well, what we found is for the most part, folks who have missions that primarily have a local impact, we're primarily raising local dollars. What I think this does show us in the case of the OHSU challenge is that we could see investment from out of state um, that'll be really interesting to see how that goes, though, because, again, you look at that $1 million category, and it's not very much coming from out of state. So it seems like our higher ed um, nonprofits are having greater success kind of in, their, in the middle of their donor pyramids in that 100K sort of range. And I don't know if that has to do with how much they are traveling out of state and how much they're cultivating those donors, or how likely it is that donors give very large gifts beyond their own community. So that's both of those questions were raised by this. Great, thanks. And Amanda was uh, involved in the survey and especially the section on the bellwether groups of which this data is pulled from. Now, when you start to add up campaigns that were reported as well as from the larger groups and from the smaller groups, you start to get some pretty big numbers. Now, we did two surveys. One, a bellwether group survey of the top 25, or which a subset of the top 25 fundraising groups, and then everybody else. Now it's interesting to note that cumulatively the top 25 fundraising groups raise almost as much as the next thousand nonprofits in Oregon in this region. So scale does matter here. Now for the, for the, for the general campaigns, just the ones that were reported, a low of 461 million total and a high of 819. That's only those reported. This isn't uh, the, the percentage of groups reporting campaigns literally doubled compared with the previous survey. So when you start to do, you know, take a look at then the larger campaigns from the top 25 bellwether groups, you add that and you get a pretty big number. Now, in the conversation with panelists, we talked about this conversation. Do any of the panelists want to comment on this? You may or may not. Several of you, Jim, we can get you a microphone. I think what, is this one? Can you hear me? I, 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 I'm Jim White from the Nonprofit Association of Oregon. So I think what's interesting about these numbers are the um, fact that this is just campaigns. And when you then add in the regular uh, requests for support for organizations, this number uh, nearly triples, if I remember in the, in the documentation you had in the, uh, in the survey. Is that right? Oh, it, it doesn't take, this is, this is in addition it's, it's hard to exactly overlay the two, but when you think about giving in Oregon being about 1.7 billion or 1.5 to 1.7 billion, that we're probably not gonna get back to 2007 giving levels until perhaps 2018, maybe 2000 or 2020. And then you have this level of pent up demand. These campaigns actually add up to, uh, well, here's the chart. Um, you know, the OHSU campaign uh, raised, oh, sorry, let me go back to a different chart. Uh, this, doing the math, one billion, it adds really up to about three billion. Right, right. Over a period of time, certainly, but three billion. Right, and that, that $1.7 billion number is the total out of the 990s for all giving. That's Correct. That's campaigns and regular. Correct. And that's and out of the, the OFC, uh, OCF report uh, and from 2010. Correct. And that 2000, that 1.7 number actually includes a $160 million bequest that was used for endowment and wasn't used for current spending. Now, the, the, the second part of my comment would be is that um, those large numbers for campaigns are always large. 
they're always large. So I think what'll be interesting is to see what is the, um, the you know, divisor that we need to kind of put into the math here to get a better sense of what the number could actually look like. But what we do know is the OSHU campaign is meant to be successful, so we at least know that the 1.2 billion is a real number. Because if they can't reach the number, they won't get the 500, 000, uh, 500 million challenge. Thank you. Mason. Hi, I'm Mason Blatcher. I used to work for Stanford Business School about 38 years ago. I discovered a fellow in Beaverton, Oregon, who we're talking about today. I have lots to tell you, but you can read it in my posthumous memoirs. <laughs> <laughs> the, the interesting thing is we've been surveying ourselves. I'd love to survey the donors in your community. Perhaps some of you have done feasibility studies recently where donors give the standard tired donor excuse, oh, this campaign is going to create a problem for your campaign, or you tend to get those in feasibility studies. But the real question as you look at single digit billions, single digit billions, <laughs> that you would like to achieve in your campaigns, think about how many billions of net worth exist among Oregonians. How many exist among our hero, Mr. Knight, who has a few more, who could make a few more gifts? That also can extrapolate among people in Oregon. Think about who really cares. Consider that while some people may feel, gosh, I have to give to the Knight Challenge, Others may feel, who is he to tell me what to give? I want to give to the Humane Society. So he's going to, you know, <laughs> nobody, nobody spilled anything on me, so you're very <laughs> So do you feel the, the, I don't know, I'm going to label it fear in the room? Am I right or no? I mean, so anxiety, thank you, much more tactful word. But so my intention by the time we leave this room is that many, I hope all, of you will have a chance to take a breath about this conversation and actually to discover a, a positive path for how you think about this and how you're going to work with people that support your organization and your mission. So, but I think it's important that we actually look at the real numbers. Now, why is that? And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but I'm going to take a segue into history for a, in a minute. So actually, you know, I'm going to back up. Um, Anthony, you know, we talked about making a comment, and also um, Dick on the campaign totals. Is that still good for you? Anthony Petrel from OMSI. So uh, we're in the middle of a, a capital campaign, about a $10 million campaign. We're in, um, about to exit the quiet phase of that. Uh, this is the first campaign we've done in over 20 years. Uh, we were also are in that uh, previous slide total where you saw the, the percentage of organizations that are increasing their uh, normal overall fundraising goal uh, by over 25%. Uh, we're also in that category. Uh, last, this last fiscal year, we increased our uh, f general fundraising by over 20% and we'll uh, projecting to do it again uh, going forward into the next uh, fiscal year. So we're, I mean, we're not, you know, negatively concerned about the Phil Knight Challenge. We think that there's a lot of pent-up uh, supply out there in the marketplace. You know, and like any good nonprofit, you know, embarking on a, a capital campaign, we did the feasibility study. We went out and we talked to, the, to our donors. We talked to the community. And we, what we heard was what we expected to hear. If people are passionate about our mission and what we're going to do, they're passionate about giving to that cause. And if they weren't necessarily, it wasn't on their top philanthropic kind of priorities, you know, not so much. Same thing goes with, you know, the Phil Knight Challenge. So while we're increasing our goals, and we actually have another two capital campaigns that are, are in the planning phase right now, uh, we're not concerned that someone's going to give to uh, the Phil Knight Challenge and not give to us because really it gets back down to being that donor-centered ask and if it's in, within that donor's um, priorities for their philanthropic kind of giving, 
it's not going to matter where, you know, if there's a, another challenge out there, they're still going to give to your organization. And one other note, we've only had one uh, donor who has uh, declined to uh, make a gift to our capital campaign because of the night challenge. Um, it wasn't a no, it was a not right now because uh, they made a stretch gift and they had a specific tie to OHSU as a former board member of that organization. So out of all of the, you know, the hundreds of uh, asks that we've, we've made, uh, we've had one that has come negative for that and it was a completely understandable situation. Thank you. And for all the, er, anyone who gets the microphone in their hand, please hold it up to their mouth um, we're hearing from the people who are live streaming that the, that the voices are not coming across clear. I know you can hear yourself, and I know people in here can hear. Um, so we'll go with Dick and then Peter. I'm a little bit surprised about the education on asking people to give, give funds. It's, it's, uh, it's an education process. A lot of people at, in my age, my age group uh, for federal taxes are paying right around 10, 12% taxes. Now, how are they doing that? It's because they're giving 501c3 giving, you add that onto the 10%, and boom, you're up to 50, 55, or 60%. So I don't think the education process on the giving is, 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 is told people on how they either send money to Washington or they can give it to you as a 501c3. Another thing, too, is that it's not there on, 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 on community giving is appreciable assets, especially to small businesses. I'm, I've sold my company to, to, uh, to my son, so I give uh, closed corporation stock to XYZ, then he buys it back, goes into treasury stock, his stock goes up, I get the tax deduction, everybody's happy, and, uh, and that's not, there's a lot of that going on right now, especially in the 60 and 70-year-old. 70, 70 let me just make one final comment too that we just came off of a campaign, a 10 month campaign in, in the metro, or in, excuse me, in the mid Willamette Valley with, uh, with food share. And we purposely went out for monthly giving, monthly giving. And you can see my little chart here. We had 400 givers when we started out in 10 months. And at the end of 10 months, we had 1,276 givers at an average of 35 bucks a month, which was a half million dollars. It's, it's, it's an absolute car deal. Instead of me asking you for $1,000, <laughs> instead of me asking you for $1,000, just give me 100 and it becomes 12 Or instead of get, writing me a check for 10000 give me 1000 a month. And it's a really an easy sell, and you broad the base out, and it really does work. Thank you, Dick. And now a quick jump back into history. Now, why am I going here for a moment? One of the things that, that I've noticed, and I saw both in the, sur the recent survey and the last several surveys, is that we have a lot of, uh, kind of unpacked or unaware, oh, you know, I forgot. You were you gonna comment, Peter? I apologize, Peter. I was just Could thinking, you stand and make yeah. sure your, the microphone's up to your I mouth? I believe it is. Thank you. I wouldn't expect that OMSI or a food bank or something like that would be involved in the zero sum game, would be uh, sacrificing funds that might go to the Knight Cancer Institute. I think there are other nonprofits, though, for whom that question might be more direct. I'm just guessing, but if you're in the healthcare field, if you're the cancer society, if you're American Cancer Society, perhaps uh, another disease, kidney, kidney disease or heart disease, those might be the ones that are more affected by money that might have gone to them but will now go more exclusively to the Knight Cancer Fund. What do you guys think? Is there anybody from any disease-oriented organizations? Carol Venata. Whoa! <laughs> They're going to hear me out state. <laughs> I'm Carol Venata from Peace Health Southwest Medical Center. So I'm in the same line of, uh, line of business. And I think uh, any of you who I've talked about this already know that I am in the camp of uh, the night challenges, the hottest thing since sliced bread. Uh, I think it's a fantastic thing for a number of reasons. First of all, I think um, it's fantastic in terms of what a successful campaign will do, not only for OHSU and for all of us who could face the threat of cancer, but also what it will do to further energize Mr. Knight 
And I think someone already mentioned that there's a lot more capacity there. So, I mean, this could be just the beginning of, you know, huge gifts from him. And I know my colleagues here from the University of Oregon are very excited about what he's going to do for them in the future. But, I mean, I think there could be a lot of wonderful giving that comes from him. But in terms of competing with other healthcare organizations, you know, um, I would say that OHSU is um, not just another healthcare organization, it is our, our medical research center uh, for this region. And so all the research that goes on at OHSU um, is going to have ben beneficial effects for all the other healthcare organizations. And I would say it, would, it will just elevate all of healthcare in this region. So I, I think we're all going to, uh, there's going to be positive fallout for all of us, I think, as we go along. Thanks, Carol. So a quick trip back in history, and I'll tell you why in a minute. What's this? It's the oil fields in 1880. This is one of the St Rockefeller's oil fields and oil production facilities. He was actually a very philanthropic man. He gave early in his career and throughout his lifetime. But the thing is, he got taken a lot. Uh, missionaries, he got taken a lot. And so he developed some rules or reactions to giving. And some of those rules, in a sense, became what we call best practices. And, and you've seen some of these, only the best causes, matching or challenge gifts. Now, he, he approached it as, as a very wealthy man uh, who was always being hit up, or in his words, dragooned into giving. Later in life, he actually, you know, he was an avid, avid golfer throughout his life, but later in life, he actually golfed alone. And when someone asked, he said, well, by the ninth hole, there's always an investment or a cause to give to. Sad. But these rules were developed in reaction. And you can see that they, for, for someone like that, they're actually pretty good rules. Don't be the first one, you know, only the best causes, you know, matching gifts, challenge. But again, good rules for him. Now, anything carry forward? You hear the same thing in some of our, uh, some of our mo rooms and meetings? I mean, the sa it's the same kind of thinking. Now, contrast that with the Bob Hope generation. And for many of those people, you know, when you think about it, they came of age during World War II. Uh, they, the GI Bill worked, uh, the, the Social Security worked, they were frugal because they grew up in the Depression, and as a result of rising real estate, because there were a lot of boomers who wanted to buy houses and there were a scarce number of houses, so housing appreciated, and of course since they were frugal they paid off their house long, long, perhaps in the 60s or the early 70s, so that when the 90s came, they were just surprised at their relative wealth. And since they were very altruistic and trusting, they said, you do good work, how can I help? Many of our fundraising models are based on interacting with that generation. And many of the ways we think about major giving come from Rockefeller's time. Now, fast forward to today, we have a, a concentration of wealth in America. Now, this is a report, it's not an opinion. If you look across the top of this slide, that's 100%. So you can see the big red square, top 1%, the next 4%. And you can't, you, the other 80%, the last quarter to, or fifth of the slide. But this group of people, top 20%, own much of the wealth in America. So when we think about major gifts, support of nonprofits, that's primarily from discretionary income. So who has that? A smaller proportion of America's wealthy. Now the challenge is, let's like, so the challenge is how do we then interact with that, those attitudes, and the, the simply the demographics of this. Now I'm going to dive into the detail for a moment of the night challenge. Now this again was from the Bellwether survey. Attitudes uh, of the Bellwether, the top fundraising groups about them. And why why this set of questions. It's interesting that most of them thought that they would all do well, yet they were a little, some of them were, said, it's kind of unlikely. Now, fundraisers are a pretty optimistic lot. I mean, that's the nature of the game. You want to make it happen. You want to, you want to believe that it all can go. But I think that we have to acknowledge that there is a, 
uh, that that, uh, shall we say, optimism, we need to be aware that we have it. Because it, I think that based on these survey results, some of that optimism might be getting in our ways of making some decisions and choices that we need to make for our nonprofit to do well. Now, about a week ago, I had a conversation with a, a businessman, and he's opened up, and I'm going to uh, fuzz the details to, to protect the identity, but the, co the content's at true. He'd opened up about 500 uh, locations of his business over the, over the last 10 or 15 years. And he provides a service that's, uh, in a sense, common. And he said, well, when I was about to move, it, move my business into a community, he said there was a lot of fear on the part of businesses providing similar services. And he said, you know what? It turned out that many of them actually made more money after I moved in. And I made a lot of money too, but they made more money. Why? Because they paid more attention to their business practices. They honed their game. They sharpened the game. And so for your organizations to say, oh, it's not going to have effect, or maybe the, a rising tide will lift it, I no. Unless you sharpen your game, then it's quite likely. But for boards, this for boards and, and executive directors, this means allocating resources to fundraising. It, because major gifts are major gifts are all about FaceTime, face-to-face -face relationship building. And so what I'd say, too many I heard this about this tendency is that we are all swimming in the same water. And we heard over and over from a number of different groups in, the, in this survey that, oh, we swim in different water. Not really. That's a little bit like a New Yorker saying, hurricanes don't matter to me. That's a Florida problem. <laughs> you know, the world's different. But that doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that if we're aware of it, we can do something about it. So that's the nature of the rest of this conversation today. So I wanted to give some of the panelists a moment if, to reflect on any of this, this, the history, swimming in the same water, um, or before we go on, if there are any. OK, so we're going to move on to this next, this next conversation. How do we grow philanthropy? Oh, wait, sorry. How do we grow philanthropy? So this is a table conversation. Here's the question. Given the history, given the competition, given the dynamics in the community, how do we grow philanthropy? I know it's a big question. But take a couple minutes at your table and wrestle with it. You're on. So panelists, I'm going to put you on the spot now and ask you to reflect on what you heard at your table or what, what you observed, comments and observations. I'm going to start with um, Peter, go to Bob, and then kind of move around the room. And if there's anyone at the tables, too, once we do that that's got a, a, a must-share, we'll have some time for that as well. Peter, please. We had a very lively conversation around one subject, collaboration and cooperation. What are the ways, if we're trying to grow philanthropy, when can, when can people, groups, collaborate and cooperate with each other? So for instance, uh, I was immediately told nobody ever shares donors, so let's cross that one off the list as possible collaborations. But are there other ones that we can do? And here's some we came up with, and I'm sure there are others. Techniques. Do you pretty widely share techniques that work in fundraising with each other? Could you do more of that? Any problem with it? Um, groups collaborating, especially smaller nonprofits, uh, combining together to go after one large grant, collaboration in that way. Uh, two or three groups going after, combining to go after one grant. Um, it was felt around this table that there's a need to educate the younger generations about the values of philanthropy. Could that be done collaborative, collaboratively? Um, collaborative. PR, marketing, generalized, grow that young generation base. Uh, and here's a question as much, so it was a little difference of opinion. You've got a, a potential donor who you figure out at some point is not going to give you money. Under what circumstances might 
you send them to somebody else to whom you think they might be more appropriate? And if you did, how would you do it? And if you, how would you make sure that they had a good experience at that other nonprofit so it doesn't reflect badly on you? All collaborative stuff. Thanks. Bob, any reflections? We had an equally uh, engaging conversation at our table. There were three or four really big things that came out. Um, and I don't know that any of these will be super shocking, but um, I'll say them. Um, the first is a real emphasis on being resourceful and understanding that the world is becoming more complex um, and the way that we reach people and, and steward people and, and build relationships is changing and that um, the way organizations work with major donors, new donors, uh, donors across the donor spectrum um, is becoming more complicated and honoring the preferences, the communication preferences that your donors have. Some of them are generational, some of them are just presence. Um, we heard this loud and clear, and I'm sure other tables did too. It's going to be absolutely essential um, for our organizations to add staff capacity to reach um, those major donors and to conduct major donor fundraising. Uh, we need more people. We need more investments in, in um, fundraising and the ability to leverage the existing assets that organizations have. Um, understanding that the way fundraising is conducted is changing dramatically. We, at our table, talked about direct mail being gone and dead in 15 years. Um, that would be interesting. Uh, another uh, strand of conversation um, involved the one million new residents coming to our state over the next 20 to 25 years. And part of the key to growing philanthropy will be, how do you reach those people? How do you engage those people? How do you get them? Who gets to them first? How, um, how do you onboard them or invest them in your mission? Two other thoughts. Definitely uh, don't forget about the public sector, which provides massive, massive, massive economic stimulus, funding and support that dwarfs uh, $1.7 billion in philanthropy. So we cannot forget about our friends in the public sector if we want to grow philanthropy. Um, finally, uh, spending money not just on staff capacity, but our major donors. Making investments, they're going to help keep our major donors happy, keep them connected, keep them involved, keep them talking positively about our programs and causes. Thank you. Lisa. And then we'll go to Jim, then Anthony, then Dick, then Mason. And remember, hold the mic up. Yes, sir. <laughs> it is on, right? OK. Perfect. Um, we talked about some ways to improve communications, especially with our major donors that uh, aren't asking always for something, that we're enhancing their tie. Uh, we've regularized a special email to give them advanced reservation capabilities, you know, just reaching out to them even on a monthly basis to make sure that they're getting a personal touch that's not a solicitation. That I, has amazing feedback. We've just started that this January. And uh, they really like that type of touch. But I want to ask um, Emily to say a few words, because she's with the American Cancer Society, and she has a really great perspective on the collaboration. Thank you. Um, for us, we're in the business of finding a cure for cancer. And so while it might seem like we would be in competition for dollars, for us, it's huge to have this opportunity coming to Oregon. To have a top 10 research facility here would, in the future, give us more ac access to donors and a better visibility within the community here. We're looking at ways to partner with OHSU to possibly help with this. And so I think that looking long term, we're looking past, this is two years. And so after that, for us and anybody else who's in the healthcare field, I think it brings a ton of opportunity here. We have other, you know, Fred Hutch in Seattle and what that's done for our local giving there has been huge. So um, we're just trying to stay really positive and be excited about it. Jim. So we um, talked about a number of the same issues that uh, people have already brought up, so I'm not going to repeat those, but a couple that um, I think were interesting and unique here was 
Um, looking out at other successful campaigns or work being done around the country, either through investigating the research that's available or just simply calling up, picking up the phone and calling up colleagues at, at like organizations uh, around the U.S. Um, the, the comment was made that um, they would likely be flattered to have the opportunity to talk about what they'd been able to achieve and how they had partnered with others in their community. Um, another comment made at our table was that um, philanthropy in Oregon, unlike the, 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 the the East Coast, what could be called East Coast philanthropy. Philanthropy in Oregon and Southwest Washington is a little bit more private and personal. And so how do you help people to open up a little bit more about their philanthropy? That there isn't that same need to have um, the, the you know, exposure that might be seen on, in, in some campaigns that you'd see on the East Coast. So working with and educating our donors as they grow in their philanthropy, how do you get them to open up and be more proactive in talking about what they're doing with their friends, with other people who may have a, a giving capacity? Um, and then one last comment we had, a little discussion we had was um, the giving patterns of the next generation, the NGen group, who now may be seen to be giving in a certain way, those patterns won't necessarily stay the same as they age. So we really need to be engaging uh, the next generation in how they're going to be giving and what they're going to be thinking about for their legacy. They also stand to inherit quite a bit of wealth themselves and how they'll steward that wealth will also be an important part and a role that we can all play. Thank you. Anthony. How do you, how do you grow philanthropy? Well, I shouldn't have to say this, but you have to ask for it. Um, <laughs> The, the money is out there, the, the wealth is out there, the income is out there, uh, but really gets down to each and every one of our nonprofits has to have the people in place to ask for it. We have to have the marketing and we have to have the, the ability to go out and talk about the impacts that we're having. So you do those things, uh, the, the philanthropy will come. It's really, it's theirs for, for our taking. You know, thank you, Bob, for mentioning you know, investing in uh, our people and systems and infrastructure of development. Um, those of us around the table, we were, we were talking, those of us over the last couple of years who have invested and grown our development capacity internally, uh, we're raising more money. It, it's this kind of, uh, it, it's not rocket science, um, unfortunately. We make it more difficult than it is sometimes. Uh, so I think if you invest in your people and your, your infrastructure and you get your folks out, not just your development folks, but everyone on your organization, from the board to the person, you know, cleaning and emptying the trash every night, every single person in that organization is a development officer and needs to be out there spreading the word about your organization. A couple other things um, that came up is um, most of our uh, development plans kind of focus on right now two groups, the boomers and the millennials. And we were kind of forgetting this whole middle section of Gen X who, uh, give through their disposable income. So I think a lot of opportunity to grow philanthropy through that Gen X group, who in most parts, honestly, not just in development and nonprofits, but everything, they've been kind of overlooked. I mean, nobody talks about Gen X right now, uh, but there's a lot of wealth that is not being uh, tapped there for philanthropy. Um, and then kind of one final thought is, um, is just really about donor stewardship. It is a lot more cost effective and a lot easier to raise a dollar from an existing donor than trying to go out and find new ones. And I think a lot of times we as nonprofits spend more time focusing on how do I need to go out and attract new donors when really it's how do I steward and cultivate the donors I already have who have the capacity to give additional gifts. So ultimately it all comes back down to we have to ask for it. Dick. Well, Betsy Fry just uh Betsy's one of my most expensive friends that I have. <laughs> uh, she just informed me I'm on the upper end of the boomers. Actually, I'm part of the old fart group. <clears throat> uh, uh, Jim, you're really right, you're really right on, on, on the, the, the privacy. That's my, one suggestion at our table was to have a champion go with you, have a, have a peer person who has earned the right to communicate to the other person. That person, if, uh, if Betsy and I are going to talk to Joe Smith, I'm the one that can ask him how much... Uh, uh, have you paid over 20 per, over 15 percent of federal taxes? You know, and I can ask them, are you going to die? You know, <laughs> and I can say, what are you going to do between now and then? <laughs> and then I can say, you're not going to take anything all of it with you. 
and, and they will get it. And then they'll ask me, well, what are you talking about? And I, we're going to be asking them for an ask. Then the first thing that they'll say to me is, what are you going to do? And that's what's, that's what's happening, happening out there. And, and I, I would really encourage you. Another thing that came from our table is that we're not asking enough. Uh, Betsy, Betsy got me going to the, to the, uh, the Tocqueville Million Dollar Roundtable, and there was a story of a person asking this individual for a million dollars, and he got furious and threw him out of his office. And he kind of remorseful, brought him over to his house. The guy asked him for a million dollars again. He got furious at him. He says, the most I'm going to give you in the next eight quarters is $250,000 a quarter. <laughs> so you, so you, you need, need to be not afraid, but it really helps. In, I'm prejudiced in this, but in a peer-to-peer -peer where you don't have big hat, no cattle talking to somebody, you have somebody who has earned the right, who has the reputation, and then you can ask the individual and explain these different things to them. I think there's a lot of people that don't understand the tax situation that we have and that you can get a return on investment on in giving. Thank you. Mason. There are two key ways to raise more money now, given, given that there are four, a good case, qualified prospects, a good ask, and leadership. I'd focus on the case. If you're having a campaign for $10 million and you have two more campaigns in the wings, it reminds me a little of the San Diego Zoo, where they hired us to finish a gorilla exhibit in the middle of the zoo. It was wonderful, but one of the people I interviewed said, what are you, yeah, I'll give you 25 or 50,000 for the gorillas, but what are you doing about the reptiles? I went back to the client. Well, we're thinking about it a few years down the road. The donor who was thinking about the reptiles had his father's name on the reptile exhibit, was in his 80s, and clearly was a million dollar prospect to renew that exhibit. Why aren't we sharing our future plans as part of our case Perhaps it's the stuff uh, kind of under the sleeve that we're not talking about in the campaign, but let's be ready to respond to the interests of donors. Another thing in terms of the staff, I loved Anthony's comment about everybody is a fundraiser. One person I interviewed for the zoo for a million bucks had given 100000 I said, how did you get started? You live two hours drive away. There aren't that many people who give to the zoo. Well, they said, I, I was in the gift shop. And I asked to buy a pin that I had seen somebody at the zoo wearing. Well, it was the donor, the $1,000 donor pin. And the gift shop lady nicely said, oh, there's somebody who handles those pins. And she brought him by the hand to the development office. That's stewardship. <laughs> That's somebody who, in, in my opinion, that person at the zoo deserved the Fundraiser of the Year Award. Um, Finally, in terms of collaboration, to go right back to Peter's point about, well, we'll collaborate, but we won't share prospects, let me suggest otherwise. Please let me suggest otherwise. The, the person I met one time who at, on a plane who asked, I'm having trouble giving to my alma mater, giving stock to my alma mater, USC. Now you'll remember I worked for Stanford. Here I am helping USC in the conversation. I said, it's fairly easy to do. You've got uh, rule 144 stock. It's a little more difficult to give. Let me put the Stanford stock lady in touch with you and she'll know her counterpart at SC and be able to finesse that for you. I later learned that the person was so impressed with how the Stanford stock lady treated her that she just said, to hell with it, give it to Stanford. She was so <laughs> And you know, I mean, is that, is that cooperation or what? The, the interesting thing is, as I, was leaving, as I was leaving on a trip, I got a phone call. That same lady and her husband uh, had a condominium they wanted to uh, give away, and they gave it to Stanford. And I have to say, uh, these things happen. In another situation, two colleges, a, a, a single-sex men's college, single-sex women's college, all kept their prospects together. They didn't want to solicit husbands and wives together. We changed that paradigm and ended up uh, raising three times as much as they ever imagined. So cooperating with prospects is, is terribly important. 
You raise a good point, Mason, in regards to cooperating. I remember being in many living rooms or dining rooms and, be, and someone says, well, I love this group. Now, we're in the room for another, on behalf of another organization. But they talk about a wide variety of things. Many people have a wide range of interests. And in a sense, they're kind of different pockets. They're going to give to children or they're going to give to the church or they're going to give to health or the education. They're going to give because all those things are important to them. For some, it may be, I'm going to give the capital campaign pledge for several years, but I'm going to continue my annual support. Uh, the challenge with this conversation is that oftentimes, uh, as development people, we're, and sometimes board people, and executive directors in particular, are so focused on the, I need the money, I deserve the money, we do good work, you should give. Uh, like, so it's almost like, where is it? And, you know, that doesn't play very well. People, you're, they're not being treated as a person. You know, a person has a wide range of interests. And it's important that we recognize that and we enable it. And that's the challenge to unlocking giving, is enabling giving. And that's going to be a leap for a lot of people. It's easily understood intellectually. But when it comes to that annual fund ask, it's, watch what goes on in your head. Watch what the little voice says. I know you all have little voices. So let's talk, any, any burning comments, any reflections? Carol, any others after Carol? All right. Well, I just thought your comments were so interesting, Mason, and just absolutely so right on. And I was looking over here at Candace, because um, I used to work for Oregon State University, and Candace works for the University of Oregon, and never the twain shall meet. Well, mm -hmm. wrong. We've got lots of mixed marriages, <laughs> <laughs> you know? But, um, but the point I really wanted to make was, you know, the divide isn't really amongst us. The divide is between the philanthropic and the non-philanthropic, really, right? We have so many people still sitting on the outside, and I think Anthony made that point, too, that there's tremendous capacity out there still, right? So rather than worrying about how the pie, the philanthropic pie, gets divided. How do we make it bigger? You got it. I had a conversation a little while ago with a person, and I'll again be a little fuzzy about the details because he's here in town, but he just showed us a picture of his new million dollar boat. He mentioned that it was a million dollars, by the way. And nice boat, but you know, how, ma how many months of the year are you gonna use it on the Columbia? Because it, it's an open boat, it wasn't a cabin cruiser, it was like it's built to go fast. Uh, three months at best, two probably, million bucks. And he said, well, I can't make this $10,000 gift. That's just way too much. <laughs> and a little while later, you could see the light go on. Like, oh, I could. And in the space of that conversation, he added a zero to that gift. Not because we were persuasive, but because we gave him the time to think through, in a sense, the, the preposterous assumptions that he had been laboring under, and he really didn't realize it. He was comparing himself to a Forbes 400 billionaire. He said, oh, that's something only somebody like that could do. Well, no, and you, it was really uh, uh, a delight, that's the word. It was a delight to see the, his facial expression because it just, you know, the light bulb goes on. It's like, oh, I could do this. And he was really excited about it. And so since then, he has actually continued to give, but we enabled that. And it's a, very, uh, it's a very patient process. And for the most part, for larger gifts, it does require relationship. It requires time. Yeah, Dick. Uh, Kevin, C Carol makes a really a good point. This is 2005 uh, uh, statistics, but household incomes of 10,000 to 15,000 gave 11.6%. Households of, uh, of uh, 50,000 to 55,000 gave 4%. Those over 100,000, all the way up of 10 million or more, gave 2.5%. There's some interesting studies that relation to empathy. And I have some friends who, uh, who are, they don't live here in this region, but they, they took all the grandchildren to Africa, and what's that cost? It was first class. And they, they came across a village, and they were, um, they were moved at the pop, just moved, and they wanted to do something about the poverty and the education of the kids. So they bought land. They started a school. They funded faculty. They funded uh, lots and lots of programs related to it. But 
their experience was they had a chance to gain empathy. And so there are actually some uh, researchers in regards to uh, wealth levels who talk about the lack of opportunity for that 1% or that 5% to actually have an experience where empathy is possible. So when these people, I'll call them you know, Bob and Mary, went to Africa, it was right there. I mean, it wasn't that it didn't exist. They had an opportunity. So our challenge is to provide larger numbers of people with powerful experiences such that they have that opportunity to have that kind of experience. Because when you think about it, moving from, I'll say, from this club to a, to a community over here, to flying out, to landing in San Diego, to, I mean, did you see any homeless people? Did you see any people in need? Did you see any people who needed mental health services? Did you see any people who needed food? I mean, the list goes on. And the answer, you already know the answer, it's no. So our challenge is to make it real for people and help them discover that. So the next exercise is, um, I'm going I'm to move on to the next exercise here, which is, and then we'll come back around for the panel comments, but how will we have constructive conversations with our supporters and our donors? Now, actually, actually, let me rephrase that. And here's why. That word, our. I don't own them. We don't own them. So there they are they're individual people. So we're in the business now of enabling. In the 1960s, the war on poverty, basically they said, we're experts, give us money, we'll make it better. And that Bob Hope generation bought that. It was very consistent with their perspective. Fast forward, what do people need and want now? They need experiences. They need experiences. They need to discover or enable and we don't necessarily know what they need. Sometimes they don't either. But that's our job to enable, to draw that out. So how will we have constructive conversations with the people who support our work and who would love to do even more? You're on at your tables. Thanks. I can tell there's lots of good conversation. So we're going to start over here with Dick and then go to Anthony. And we're going to go quickly around the room. And I'm going to ask panelists just to quickly comment. And I'm emphasizing the word quickly. One-liners, two-liners, that sort of thing. Quick reflections. Dick, yeah, you're on. Yeah. Some type of training for uh, soliciting of, of uh, people how to ask for the larger gifts. And then also learning about your donors. And then. My plug would be to have a champion go with you who knows the donor, who has that relationship, who is respectful in that relationship. Great. Thank you. Anthony. You know, I think just being open and, and honest about having those conversations and going into those conversations without having an agenda in, in mind um, and really making sure that we are, are listening as much as we're talking. You know, going in without an agenda is an important point. One group that I worked with, they just finished a $43 million campaign. And they were debriefing some of their donors, and one of them said, well, you know, I gave to you because I like you and you do good work. But that wasn't really my thing. But you gave a lot. And he said, well, it wasn't really my thing. Well, it, what is your thing? We want to do that. <laughs> and so it's important to realize that, you know, with that greatest generation or that Bob Hope generation, we could easily pitch product. We have a good thing. You should buy it. You do good work. I will. But now it's a very different environment. A lot of the work that we do really is enabling and making possible people's dreams in the world. And so how do we make that, how do we make those dreams come true? We have to ask, we have to enable. Jim. Yeah, so in, in line with that as well, you know, sharing the stories of your, your program participants, your beneficiaries that may not be, they, they may be unexpected. They may be the group that um, you're impacting that your, your you know, chief friends don't understand that you impact. So be ready to tell those stories, understanding what's important to them. Um, engage them in direct activities, you know, get them involved in other ways. Don't forget about those moments when it's not the ask moment, but it's just the stewardship moment. Um, 
we, we, again, second Dick's comment about the big hat, no cattle, you know, have other stakeholders there, have people who are, who are going to be able to stand with you and, and support you and, and help explain why their gift is going to be so important. And a comment I really loved at our table was keep staff stable and develop them, invest in them. Um, you know, they are your greatest asset, so you've got to make sure you're developing your own staff. One of the things that came out in the survey in regards to staff and staff turnover, one of the key things, relationship of fundraisers with the boss. Now, one group that I was familiar with, um, not in Portland, just for the record, uh, they'd gone through three development directors in a row. One, the first one um, left and didn't return after um, having a baby. The next one got a different kind of job. The third one, there was another something happened. But the executive director said, well, these people are really flighty except all three went on to be stunning, stunning successes in their next job. So it began to be, to me, to be, maybe you should look at yourself, Mr. Executive Director. And shortly thereafter, the board did fire him. <laughs> now, that wasn't a direct cause. There were other things. But my point being is, too often it's easy to say or point a finger at development people and label them something. But let's look at the key relationship. I mean, when it's not working, there's turnover. So there's more in the survey if you're curious. Lisa. I'll, I'll make it brief, but I think um, what we really came around to was what we all know about those face-to-face -face or maybe, you know, don't presuppose what someone's position is or why they may be disengaged from your organization and at least make that attempt to contact them, to reach out to them and um, examples of successes where someone had been disengaged and they went and they listened and they were, and the prospect was excited to hear the updates of what was going on and it resulted in a significant gift. We all are buried at our desktops. The hardest thing about being in the development world is getting out from behind our desks and going out and seeing those folks face to face or even picking up the phone. And I'm as guilty as all the rest of you. So I've just made it a priority that I have to reach out to two personally every week. If I can't fit in two phone calls, two emails to try and get a meeting with a donor, then something's wrong, right? And, and that's hard even. But that two a week really pays off. And so make it, make it manageable, but make a commitment and make it a priority. Bob or Peter, you may or may not have comments. We've sure. got time. Real quickly, um, from our table, uh, and we heard this from Jim and others, but in the way that you conduct yourself in those conversations, being honest, uh, direct, frank, open, genuine, um, remembering to listen and be respectful of the knowledge and the experiences your donors have, not feeling the compulsion to constantly be selling, selling, selling. Uh, taking the long view in these conversations and understanding that you're in it, you're in it, you're in it to be in it, um, and that results aren't going to happen after a single conversation, one or two conversations. Having the patience. And then um, finally, um, drawing on the uh, gorilla reptile analogy, <laughs> being able to speak thoughtfully about your organization's long-term plans and visions, um, and being able to talk about those fluently with, with donors, even more importantly, how do you engage those donors in that conversation and make them feel invested in that planning and feel, feel as though or involve them in that planning in some meaningful way? Thank you. Peter. What I, hear, what I heard at this table was, or what I learned, is that it's incredibly individual. So that if you got meals on wheels, you like have the golden narrative. Um, it's compelling. Nobody's against it. And it's easy to, to uh, have people embrace your story. If you're involved in the criminal justice system, it's not nearly so easy to uh, connect your donors, your potential donors, with the people you're serving, which in this case are mostly uh, felons out of prison, right? Um, much, much more difficult. And if you're Oregon Episcopal School, where the great majority of your people are connected directly with uh, the school itself, their students, or they have children who are students, they were students, their grandparents, whatever. So then I asked, well, what about that universe of people who might give to the school who have no actual connection with it? And they said, it's good to have something like Episcopal in your name. <laughs> <laughs> Mason. Quickly, 
the major orifice of fundraising is this, not this. I think we'll all agree. Listening and finding out and playing the Dale Carnegie role of helping someone to achieve what he or she wants to do and he or she will move heaven and earth to help you help him, her. So it, it, that really is significant. Second, help people to rationalize giving. Every person in this room has spent more money than we needed to at some time on something. There was a sale at Nordstrom. I got a bonus. <laughs> hey, it's, it's a bargain. I won it in an auction. Or, it, you know, <laughs> you all have these ra things you rationalize. Don't tell me you don't. And philanthropists do the same thing. They've got to figure out from a right brain and a left brain point of view why they should do it. Once I had an expansion of a Ronald McDonald house where they came out at me with a case for support that would warm the cockles of any banker's heart. It looked like a loan application. Exactly why they needed, how many room nights. It was perfect, except it was soulless. It wasn't until I visited the Ronald House, met the kids, heard the stories, and put them in the case for support, discovered that the one of the uh, supporters of the house, a, a football player on the 49ers, Randy Cross, uh, would come to the house every once in a while to autograph pictures of himself. Uh, he, he threw a golf tournament every year. And we visited a few months later the cold, hard-hearted McDonald owners and operators who had already been there and done that by buying the house in the first place. They needed to give another million dollars to expand the house I don't think so. Well, we told the story of how Randy came to the house and provided eight by 10 autographed photos of himself. And one of the little boys went into the trailer because there was not enough room at the inn for his family to get his chemo appointments. He went into the little trailer and brought back one of those, you know those cute little elementary school photographs that you brought home, little tiny thing, and he took his crayon and he wrote his name and he gave the thing to Randy Cross. <laughs> and at that precise moment of telling that story, out of that door came the little boy with his pictures and out of that door came Randy Cross and at the rostrum, the president of the owners and operators immediately called for a vote and it was a million dollars. So the right, the right brain and the left brain, the, the rationalization of why you need this. I'm sitting with the Humane Society. They've got the warm, fuzzy creatures, but then they need to be sure that they have the left brain to properly expand their case. So there's, lo there's lots of food for thought here. Now, oftentimes when you go to a lunch or go to a conference, you hear lots of good ideas, you have wonderful insights, and then the parking lot happens. Or you drive back and you get to the office and there are three, three phone messages or 50 emails, whatever it is. So we're gonna take a couple of minutes right now and you've got some cards of a variety of colors at the table. But this is for you to write down the one thing you're going to do next week and to put what you learned or an aha or a discovery from this conversation. What's one thing you're going to do next week in regards to moving this along? Now, pick something that you can actually accomplish. That's key. Make it small enough that you can do it. You're on. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I'm going to ask her what she's going to do. Just blurt it out. So she's going to reach out to two specific donors. Oh. What are you, what are you going to do? That was mine also. Say it, say it out loud, though. Reaching out to two specific donors, but I'm also going to pursue more in-kind donations. Cool. Who else? I'm coming over here. All right. I'm putting you on the spot. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Call Bob's belt. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a useful exercise. So anybody else want to share what they're going to do? There's a lot that you're going to do. 
I'm going to contact two prospects a week. Same thing. Same story. But, but, but what? Oh, I think, I think that was a really helpful suggestion that a doable bite-sized chunk. We can talk to two people a week. And it actually grows. Get out of the office more. How about over here? What are you going to do? I am going to reach more young alumni. Uh, oh. You laughed. <laughs> Payback. I'm going to contact a donor every day. Thanks. Any other? So I know, oh, where's the, were there others? So it's just a few minutes after one. I want to thank you for um, voting with your feet today to spending some time to think through some of this conversation as we think about what this challenge means. I mean, it is a wonderful opportunity that someone has stepped forward and said, here's a $500 million, third largest gift nationally last year, to say, I'm, I want to invest in this community if this community will step up to it. And then we have the campaign to meet that challenge. As we look at the distribution of wealth and the changing kind of expectations, the philanthropic landscape is beginning to change. We are in some degree of a paradigm shift, and that will affect how we work, how we will make our decisions, how we will budget as nonprofits. So remembering the, what the business owner who said, he said, the people, when I opened up a competing organization, he said, those groups around me actually made more because they attended to business better. They sharpened their game. So our challenge as the nonprofit sector was we're going to have to sharpen our game. And it's up to many of you, representing a wide range of organizations here, it's up to you to carry that message to your organization. And it's up to you, really, to enable, to be someone who um, really enables and makes possible you know, dreams of what we'd like this community to be. Because philanthropy is really uh, it's community glue. It supports the many things that make this community a good place to live, a good place to move to, and a good place to stay in. And a, and a good place to brag about when you're traveling. <laughs> I appreciate the good work that all of you do. And the difference it makes is profound. So thanks for voting with your feet and being here today. Bravo, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for all of our panels for being here today. We're happy that you could be here. And we hope that next, year, next month you would join us at the University Club for our community in 3D, diversity, demographic, and demand. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Go back and do good work.